The polynomial function p is given by p of x equals negative 4x to the fifth plus 3x squared plus 1. Which of the following statements about the end behavior of p is true? So this is a quintic, all right? I know it's a quintic because the highest degree is 5. So quintics usually look like this, something like that. However, when your leading coefficient is negative, and by leading coefficient, I mean the number attached to x to the fifth, when it's negative, things are flipped upside down, so now it will look something like that. So the end behavior as it's going to the left is infinity, and as it goes to the right is negative infinity. So we need to pick the guy that works for that. So when it mentions the limit as x approaches negative infinity, that means to the left. So we want one that has negative infinity approaching regular infinity and regular infinity approaching negative infinity, so not u. Negative infinity is approaching positive infinity. That works for me. Positive infinity is approaching negative infinity. That works for me. Uh, this won't do it. And this won't do it. Now let's just make sure that the reasoning is acceptable. The sign of the leading term of P is negative, and the degree of the leading term is odd. Therefore, there you have it. So B is my guy. And again, because this is a quintic, with a negative leading coefficient. So as the limit approaches negative infinity, it goes up, which is positive infinity. And as the limit approaches positive infinity, it goes down, which is negative infinity. Hmm, so many infinities. It's like a car dealership. The depth of water in feet at a certain place in a lake is modeled by this function w right there. That's the depth of water. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's an M. Night Shyamalan movie. The graph of y equals w of t is shown for t is in between 0 and 30, where t is the number of days since the first day of a month. What are the intervals of t on which the depth of water is increasing at a decreasing rate? All right, okay. First off, if the slope is positive, it's increasing. But we don't just want positive slopes because we see positive slopes everywhere. They want increasing at a decreasing rate. What's the difference? Well, increasing at an increasing rate We'll just say increasing, increasing, looks like this, where as you increase, it gets steeper along the way. We don't want that. What we're looking for is increasing at a decreasing rate where it's still increasing, but as it increases, it kind of levels out. So this is what we want. So it's like concave down, but in the upward trend. Now the only concave, so this is increasing, but at an increasing rate, don't want you. This is increasing at a decreasing rate, so we do want u. Decreasing, this right here is increasing at an increasing rate. So the area that we want, the only spot that we want, is this concave down but increasing spot right here, which is in between 3 and 6. So the intervals of t on which the depth of water is increasing at a decreasing rate is a, where it's the interval 3, 6, only nothing else. Okay? Done so. Which of the following functions has a 0 at x equals 3 and has a graph in the xy plane with a vertical asymptote at x equals 2 and a hole at x equals 1? All right, well, let's, let's do this. Let's do this. If something has a hole, that means there's an x minus 1 on the top and on the bottom of a rational function. There you go. If it has a vertical asymptote at x equals 2, that means it has an x minus 2 in the denominator, but not in the numerator, if I can speak properly. If it has a 0 
at x equals 3, that means there's an x minus 3 living upstairs and nothing like it downstairs. So it looks like what I have to do is foil each of these out and uh, see what I get. One more time, if you're wondering, whoa, 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 where did you get all this? A whole is when you have the same factor living upstairs as you have downstairs. Why is it negative? Because if we follow the zero product property is zero exists at the opposite of its factor, as long as the factor is just an X minus or X plus something. That's where the whole came from. The vertical asymptote came from the fact that we have an X minus two living down here, but not one living up here. The zero at X equals three comes from the fact that we have an X minus three up here and nothing like it downstairs. That's where my zeros exist. My zeros exist where my uh, polynomial in the numerator is set equal to zero. So if it's X equals three, that must be because that's X minus three up top. All right, let's scooch all of these out of the way. Let's scooch all of these out of the way. Such pretty colors. It's like an abstract art painting. But better. Let's foil. I've got x squared. Let's do a little quick foil. Minus 3x minus 1x is minus 4x. And then negative 1 times negative 3 is positive 3. Down here, we have x squared minus 2 minus 1 is negative 3x. Negative 1 times negative 2 is plus 2. And that leads me with just A as an answer. Making sure I didn't see any typos. And yeah, that's it. That's the only guy. So again, we set up kind of like the factored version, multiply it out, it ends up being A. Uh, we're not allowed to use a calculator, so it wouldn't be fun graphing all of these and see which one matches that because this is a no calculator allowed section. But there you have it. The answer is A. The polynomial function P is an odd function. All right, we'll talk about what that means in a second. If P of three equals negative four is a relative maximum of P, which of the following statements about P of negative three must be true? Let, let's first talk about even and odd uh, functions. An even function, I know we're not dealing with an even function, but an even function treats the y-axis as a mirror. So for example, if I were to draw something like this on the left side, it's got to be a mirror image of that on the right. I am not an artist. Leave me alone. Uh, something that is an odd function is basically like a spun shape. Okay, it's symmetry. Uh, basically, I don't want to say it's, it's symmetric. It's symmetric around the origin is probably the best way to say it. So if it's odd, right, and I have something like this going on, that happens. And I think that's probably the best picture I'll draw. So this is what I have going on here. Again, if, maybe the best way to explain this is if I were to spin this 180, uh, I get the same exact image. If I were to flip that over sideways, I'd get the same exact image. That's the difference between even and odd. What I have is an odd shape. So what's happening here, what's happening here is at three, I get negative four. At three, I get negative four a point right there, and this is going to be a relative maximum. So I'm at the top of a hill here. So if I were to take this and spin this around, flip it around, that would be negative three, that would be positive four, and then I would get some kind of shape at the bottom here. So what I could say is, I don't know what the rest of this shape looks like. I could just go like that for all I care and it would be just fine. Okay, but what I could say here is if I have P of negative four, if P of three rather equals negative four, and if that is a relative maximum, then P of negative three equals positive four is a relative minimum. 
And that gets me C. Okay? So kind of a weird problem, but, you know, we did it. I believed in us. The function g is given by g of x equals some cubic with an x attached to everything. The function h is given to us by a quadratic. Let k be the function h over g, so kind of upside down. What is the domain? Whenever you're asked to find the domain of a rational function, you're hoping to find places in the denominator that get you a zero. Now, whenever you have a zero in the denominator, things are undefined. I don't care what happens up here. Don't care at all. I only care about what happens in the denominator. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write out that k of x equals h, which is x squared minus, that's supposed to be a squared, minus 2x minus 35. That's going to be over g of x, which is x cubed minus 3x squared minus 18x. Now, you might be thinking, let's factor everything. I can't emphasize enough that when you're trying to find where a rational function is undefined, we don't care at all about the numerator. If we were graphing this and finding holes and stuff like that, or finding y-intercepts or horizontal asymptotes, then that matters. But I don't care if all I'm trying to do is find the domain. So let's factor out an x. That leaves us with x squared minus 3x minus 18. Okay, we still have an I don't care living up in the numerator. In the denominator, I should be able to factor that out a little bit further to two numbers that add up to negative 3 and multiply out to negative 18. Looks like negative 6, positive 3 should do the trick. Now using the zero product property, we are going to find the zeros of the denominator. So we set x equal to zero, and that gives me zero. If x minus six is zero, add six to both sides, and we have a six. And if x plus three is set equal to zero, subtract three, and you get negative three. So our domain is going to be all the x values all the reals, as it says up here, that's the way they want it written out, all the real numbers, but x cannot equal, they want it in order, negative 3, 0, and x cannot equal 6. That gives us c as an answer. Again, if we're being asked to find the domain, the domain is going to be everything except for the numbers that make our function undefined. And the numbers that make our function undefined are numbers that make the denominator zero. And that's that. The figure shown is the graph of a polynomial function g. Which of the following could be an expression for g of x? All right, so we have all these factored things and then this picture. So this is what we need to notice, okay? This is going to look like x plus something. Now, you might be thinking, what are you talking about? That's a negative. It's on the left side of the origin. If you're using the zero product property and you're factoring stuff and you set an x plus a number equal to zero, you're going to get a negative number for a root. So this is going to be x plus something. This guy right here is going to be x minus something. But you know what? That guy right there is also going to be x minus something. Now, this could be a small number like 1. So I'll put x minus a small number. This is going to be a larger number like 8. So I'll do x minus a big number. Most importantly, see how that number goes right through the x-axis. That number goes right through the x-axis. And this guy just kind of skips off the x-axis. Whenever it skips off like that, that is a double root. So whatever this guy is, is going to be squared. 
So I'm going to have a parentheses, a parentheses, and a parentheses square. So looking at my total possible answers, parentheses, 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 no squares. Parentheses, 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 no squares. Here's two squares, but ah, I need an x minus a kind of big number square x minus a number square, x plus a number square, so it can't be u. Let's double check. x minus big number square, x minus smaller number, and x plus some any number, who cares? C is my guy. Okay? There you have it. Oh boy, the table gives values for a polynomial function f, there it is, at selected values of x, there they are. Let g of x equal a f of bx, okay, plus c, where a, b, and c are positive constants. In the xy plane, the graph of g, this new guy, is constructed by applying three transformations to the graph of f in this order horizontal dilation by a factor of two, gross, a vertical dilation by a factor of three, not that gross, and a vertical translation by five units, what is the value of g of negative four. This is a awful, gross, awful, terrible problem. But I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. So what we're going to do first is we're going to start out by looking at the order that they want this in. They want to do a horizontal dilation. Okay, whenever you have to do a horizontal dilation, usually what you do is you take whatever uh, f of x you have. All right, so I'm, this is going to be applied to this in a specific order. Uh, and you, whatever that number is, you divide it the x inside the f of part, inside the function, you divide the x by that number. So a horizontal dilation by a factor of 2 is going to look like this. Now in the case that we have, I have f of bx. So f of x over 2 can be written as f of half an x, like so. So in this case, we are going to have a B of one half. So that's gross thing number one. Once we have that, we are being told that we have a vertical dilation by a factor of three. Now, when you have a vertical dilation, you take your F of X and you multiply that guy to three. Now, that affects the stuff inside the parentheses here in no way. So 3 times f of x is going to take this guy and make our a 3. Now the easiest part about all of this is the vertical translation of 5 units. That just means you're moving your graph up, th up 5. So in this case, plus c means c is 5. So I have three things that I need to put together here, okay? I have b is a half, a is 3, and c is 5. So g of x is going to be 3f of 1 half x plus 5. They want g of negative 4. So g of a negative 4 means I write this whole thing out and replace every x with negative 4. So 3 times f of half of negative 4 plus 5. Half of negative 4 makes this f of negative 2 plus 5. According to this guy up here, if x is negative 2, f of negative 2 is 5. So this becomes f of negative 2 is 5. 3 times 5 plus 5. 3 times 5 is 15. 15 plus 5 is 20. So this was a god-awful problem. Terrible. On a scale from 1 to 10, I'd give it about an 11 and a half. But we did it, and I'm proud of us. Good job. Good job, everybody.
Let K, W, and Z be positive constants, which of the following is equivalent to log base 10 of KZ over W squared. So we are going to expand a logarithm. So whenever you're looking to expand logarithms, you're looking at division, you're looking at exponents, and you're looking at multiplication. The first thing you want to rip apart first is the division. So if I'm dividing something inside of a log, it must be because I subtracted separate logs first. So what I'm going to do to split this is I'm going to turn this into log base 10 of kz minus log base 10 of w squared, okay? When I condense them, when I put together, when you subtract logs, you divide. So going backwards as if I'm dividing inside of a log, it must be because I subtracted them. Now we can kill two birds with one stone here now that these guys are separate, okay? This guy right here has log base 10 of k times z. In order to have k times z, I must have been adding the original logs to put those together. So I have log base 10 of k plus log base 10 of z. Over here, I have log base 10 of w squared. Whenever you have an exponent inside a log, bring it out front. So this becomes 2 log base 10 of w. Everything's ripped out the way it should be. Log base 10 of k plus log base 10 of z minus, up oh, wrong one. So it's not this one. Log base 10 of k minus log base 10 of z plus 2 log base 10 of w. The answer is d for this one. Fun! Values of the terms of a geometric sequence g sub n are graphed in the figure. All right, so the first term is 8, the second term is 4, blah, -de blah, -de blah. Which of the following is an expression for the nth term of the geometric sequence? Geometric sequences are usually given to us by a sub n, but you know, they want us to use g sub n because I don't know, gangsters? Who knows? But it's going to equal the first term times the common ratio. Now the common ratio is what you multiply to get to the next term every single time uh, to the nth term minus one power. So what do we know? We know the first term a sub one is going to equal eight. Now do we know the common ratio? Kinda, we can find it out. If we go from eight to four to two, to one, we must be multiplying by a half every time we get there. Some of you might be thinking divide by two, but common ratio is always given to us by multiplication. We have to find the nth term, so n is still n. So let's put it all together. g sub n equals a, which is eight, times one half, because it's r, to the n minus one. And you're like, oh, hooray, yippee, I've got it. Until you realize this is none of those. So this is what we have to deal with. First things that will never change is the one half. The common ratio has to be one half. So that eliminates b. If we have eight and one half here, then this can't possibly be n. And if we have one half and n minus one here, then this can't possibly be 18. So why, oh, why, oh, why is this the same as that? Why are we given an equation where n minus one is our exponent, but we have an answer of n minus two? Well, it's a stupid problem. I'm not a fan of it. Now, eight can be written as four times two. like so. And I'm going to keep writing the one half to the n minus one. Now what I can do is I can turn two into one half to the negative first power, which is then being multiplied to one half to the n minus one. When you multiply terms of the same base, you add the exponents. So n minus 1 plus negative 1 is n minus 2. So this is the same as that. I can't reiterate the fact that this is a really stupid problem, 
but it's not impossible. Anything's possible with God. Like and subscribe. The table gives values of the function g for selected values of x. The function f is given by f of x equals 3 to the x plus x squared. What is the value of f of g of 3? Okay, well, g of 3, this guy right there, means I could just take 3, plug that in. So g of 3, g of 3 is negative 2. So now what this wants us to do is it just wants us to find f of negative 2. f of x is 3 to the x, so 3 to the negative 2, plus negative 2 squared. This can be written as 1 over 3 squared because of negative exponents. Negative 2 times negative 2 I think is 4. So writing these out, I have 1 over 9 plus 4, if I wanted to write it over 9, is 36 over 9. See what I did there? And this whole thing gets us 37 over 9. So let's be Weird problem, but not that bad. Not so bad at all. Eminem. A food vendor developed a new sandwich type for sale. What? <laughs> a new sandwich type? All right. The vendor made estimates about the sales of the new sandwich type over time. A linear regression was used to develop a model for the sales over time. The figure here shows a graph of the residuals of the linear regression. Which of the following statements around the linear regression are true? All right. So... Let's make some fake arbitrary graph. Let's make it linear like so. Now the linear is also known as the expected value. Residuals, residuals are the actual value compared to the expected value. So basically what's happening is that first time that this happens, your actual value is way below the expected value. Then it gets a little bit closer then it's right on. Then it's a little bit more. Then it's a lot of bit more. Then it slows down a little bit, but it's still more. And then again, and then it starts getting closer to the line and then starts getting closer to the line and then it hits the line and then now it's below the line, so kind of maybe flattens out. It looks kind of weird like that. But basically, this is what the graph looks like if I'm comparing residuals to some fake line that I just created. Exact? No. Somewhat accurate? Yeah, I would say so. So, what's true? I used a linear regression and I probably shouldn't have. And that's probably where my question is supposed to be that, you know, I use this red line right here to try to look at these dots right there. The linear model is not appropriate because there is a clear pattern in the graph of the residuals. Yes, the linear model is not appropriate because the graph of the residuals has more points above zero than below. No. The linear model is appropriate? No. The linear model is appropriate? No. The answer is A. It's definitely not. These blue dots are the actual values, and these two blue dots uh, probably show something that it starts out bad, then gets really good, and then flattens out. Okay? Uh, neither of which a linear model is appropriate for. Okay? So A is my guide. I'm sticking with that. The value in millions of dollars of transactions processed by an online payment platform is modeled by the function M. The value is expected to increase by 6.1% each quarter of a year, interesting wording there, at time t equals zero years, $54 million, my net worth of transactions were processed. 
if t is measured in years, which of the following is an expression for m of t, a quarter is one fourth of the year, just in case you didn't know. So this screams compounded interest. And the compounded interest formula is this. The amount that you have equals p, which stands for the principal, your initial amount, times one plus the rate written as a percent over the number of times compounded in a year to the number of times compounded in the year, again, times T is your time in years, okay? Principal, the amount of money that you start out with, rate as a decimal, N is number of times compounded in a year, T is time in years. What do we know? We wanna call A, M of T, so that's thing number one, Principal is $54 million, but it looks to me that they don't want us to write it out in millions of dollars. In fact, it says that somewhere here. Um, so we're just gonna call P54, one plus. Here's gonna be interesting. The rate is 6.1% each quarter of the year. If it didn't say quarter of the, we would say you know, 61% over four. But since it mentions quarter of a year, we're pretending that that N isn't there. I'm not a fan, but that's obviously what it wants us to do. Now, if you're like, well, I divided by four anyway, that's fine. You'll realize that that's not what you want after I use the numbers that we're supposed to use. By the way, I'm using 0.061 because it's 6.1%. Uh, that is being taken to the N, which is the number of times compounded in a year, four times T, which we don't know. Okay. When I combine everything, M of T, is gonna equal 54. One plus 0 0.061 is 1 1.061 to the four T, which is you. Again, I would look at this problem and probably not even realize about that O N kind of being, or over N being useless until I got to this point here. And then I would be like, well, why aren't all of these different? Well, because they decided to make the wording different. But other than that being the weird part, it was a pretty straightforward problem. So there you have it, compounded interest. An interesting problem indeed. <laughs> no. Uh, like and subscribe. Iodine 131, which pumps through my veins, has a half-life of eight days. In a particular example or sample, the amount of iodine 131 remaining after D days can be modeled by the function H given by that. Oh, we have a half-life function already. That's nice. Where A sub zero is the amount of iodine in the sample at the time D equals zero, which basically means this is the initial amount. It's telling you right now what the half-life formula is. Okay, which is nice. It kind of makes life a little bit easier. Uh, which of the following functions, K, all right, models the amount of iodine remaining after T hours where A sub zero is the amount of iodine in the sample at T equals zero again. All right, so we're given the example, but they want to make it K of T instead of H of D because now we're turning T, uh, D into T. This is what it wants us to do. It's a pretty straightforward problem until the very end where it gets weird for no reason whatsoever. All right, it wants us to take this formula and instead of focusing on D, focus on T. And then it tells us that T is 24D. So I'm gonna rewrite everything, but replace D with whatever it's supposed to be. Now, right now, it's not even solved for D. So let's go over here, okay? If I have T equals 24D and I'm supposed to solve for D, then I'm going to divide both sides by 24. And so D is going to equal T over 24. Simple enough. I can handle that. So I'm going to replace uh, D with t, uh, t over 24. And that's going to be all over 8. So this looks very sloppy. Not a fan with how sloppy that looks. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this part over here, rewrite it, T over 24, all over eight. I'm gonna remind myself that eight is the same thing as eight over one. And if I multiply the bottom by a reciprocal, that gets rid of the entire bottom fraction immediately. Boom, boom. 
So this becomes T over, what is that, 194? 192. So I can write this out. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite that green function k of t equals a sub 0, the original amount, times 0 0.5, which stands for a half, to the t over 192. And then I go over to these options and see that I don't have one of those options. They want me to rewrite it out like this for some reason, and who knows why. Who knows why at all? Now, the only one that's going to match up was D. And here's why. If I wanted to, for some crazy reason, I can write K of T out as A sub 0. That doesn't change. They kind of want me to throw it into a parenthesis, 0 0.5. And what I can do is I can kind of extract 1 over 192 like so, and then keep t on the outside. Because there's a rule that you learned back in Algebra 1 that when I multiply these guys, I multi when I have a, you know, an, e or, uh, an exponent to an exponent, I multiply exponents. So 1 over 192 times t is t over 192. There you have it. So weird problem. I don't know why it had to make it all weird like that, but it wouldn't be an AP exam otherwise. So there you go. The answer is D. What are all values of x for which ln of x to the third minus ln of x equals 4? Now, when I see two lns right next to each other, I remind myself that lns follow the same exact rules as logs. And if I'm subtracting two logs or subtracting two lns in this case, you divide the inside. So x to the third over x is going to equal 4, where this guy is trapped inside ln. Ln, by the way, is going to become x squared, and that equals 4. Now, you can rewrite this as e to the 4 equals x squared because of those ln rules. Square root both sides, and when I square root both sides to solve for an x, x is going to equal positive or negative the square root of e to the fourth, which is positive or negative e squared. Now, before I go over here and happily circle this guy, it's not b. And if you're like, whoa, 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 why isn't it b? I got plus or minus. Well, let's go to the original problem. If you're saying that my answer is positive e squared, and you were to go over here and type that out, you'd be in great shape. However, if you were to try to plug in a negative into an ln, you can't take the ln of a negative number. It is undefined. So, can't be b. So, this is incorrect. The only answer that I have is e to the second, the positive version, which is going to be c. So, really tricky problem. I I'm not a fan. Again, it's one of those, you know, problems where most people would probably put B and only the really careful people would put C, but you're just going to have to be careful, I guess. Let f of x equal 1 plus 3 secant x and g of x equal negative 5. In the xy plane, what are the x coordinates of the points of intersection of the graphs of f and g for these uh, bounds right here between 0 and 2 pi. All right, so I view this in a way as kind of like a system of equations problem, where this is a y equals and a y equals. So what I can do is just set them equal to each other. Negative 5 equals 1 plus 3 secant x. Let's subtract 1. Let's subtract 1. Negative 6 is equal to 3 secant x x, divide everything by 3, divide everything by 3, negative 2 equals secant x. Look at all that space that I made. Now, why did I make so much space? Well, I'm going to inverse secant both sides, like so.
When I do that, I'm going to flip it around. X is going to equal 2 pi over 3. Now, secant is negative, and remember the secant right here is negative. Secant's negative, the same spots that cosine's negative, and that's quadrant 2 and quadrant 3. Now, this guy lives in quadrant 2. Here's a little picture. Okay, here's pi, here's half a pi. That's supposed to be 2. So 2 thirds pi is going to live, I don't know, somewhere like that. Okay, this is quadrant 2. I need a quadrant 3 example. So if this is 2 pi over 3, that means it's 1 third of a pi away. So similarly, this guy is also going to be 1 third of a pi away. And pi plus a third is going to also give me 4 pi over 3. That's going to be my guy. So my two answers are going to be 2 pi over 3 and 4 pi over 3, which is u or c. The nice thing, I guess, when you see a problem like this uh, and you get to this first part and not even think about the possibility that could, there could be a second part is there's only one of these that says 2 pi over 3. So water gun to your head if you had to do a problem like this and you see, you know, well, I, I only got 2 pi over 3, so I guess the other answer is 4 pi over 3. You're in good shape for that. But, uh, yeah, that's how you do it. Answer C. The figure shows the graph of a sinusoidal function, g. What are the values of the period and amplitude of g? All right, well, let's not overthink this. I mean, uh, this peaks out at 3, this bottoms out at negative 3, so the amplitude is 3, very simple. And the period is where it repeats. So let's go here. Goes down, goes up, goes down. This is 5, this is 13. The period is going to be 13 uh, minus 5, which is 8, giving me a period of 8. The altitude is 3, so the period is 8. The altitude is 3. The answer is B, a, a rare friendly problem on an AP test, but I'll take it. I'll take it. What are the values of theta, where negative pi is less than or equal to theta, which is less than or equal to pi, for which 2 cos theta is greater than negative 1, and 2 sine theta is greater than root 3? Pretty brutal problem. Okay, and the way I'm going to start out is I'm going to take 1 at a time. I'm going to divide 2 from both sides, and that leaves me with 2. A regular cos theta is greater than negative 1 over 2. Now, there's a rule for inequalities that says if you have a cosine of stuff is greater than a number, then what you do is negative cos inverse of that number, so negative 1 over 2, is going to be less than x, which is less than regular cosine's inverse of that number, negative 1 over 2. What that leaves us with is the inverse cosine of 1 half is regular 2 pi over 3. So this is going to be negative 2 pi over 3 is less than x, which is less than regular 2 pi over 3. Okay, not fun, but there you have it. The other guy, and of course this is a keyword and, I'm going to divide both sides by 2 again, and that's going to give me sine theta is greater than root 3 over 2. Now there's a rule for sine that says if you have sine of theta is greater than stuff, then you take the inverse sine of that stuff, in our case root 3 over 2. x is going to be in between that and pi minus the inverse sine of that stuff, root 3 over 2. The inverse sine of root 3 over 2 is pi over 3. That's going to be less than pi minus pi over 3. So pi minus a third of a pi is going to be 2 thirds of a pi, 
or 2 pi over 3. Now, the key thing here is the fact that this is and. So if I'm thinking any qualities that are separated by the word and, I need to find up where if I were to graph all of this, where these guys match up. So I'm going to graph the red guy first. I'm going to say one, two, three. You're going to be negative pi. One, two, three. You're going to be regular pi. And I'm splitting this up by thirds because all of these numbers seem to deal with thirds. Similarly, I'm going to graph this guy in blue and do the exact same thing, trying to make the exact same looking picture, splitting it up the exact same way with thirds because thirds seems to be consistent with all of this negative pi. All right. I care about stuff in between negative 2 pi over 3, so u, and positive 2 pi over 3, so u, shade and everything in between. Don't fill in the circles because it's not or equal to. For blue, however, I only care about stuff in between pi over 3 and 2 pi over 3, shade and everything in between. Since this is an and formula, I only care about where both of my shadings meet, and that happens to be in between here and here. So all of the action happens in between pi over 3 to 2 pi over 3. That's the guy that I want. So doing this whole thing, the magic numbers that I seem to get were 2 pi over 3 and pi over 3. So if you're looking at these guys, the only options that really give you that are D. But this is why it makes sense. Whether it's an easy problem or not, it certainly isn't an easy problem. This is why it makes sense. So the answer for this guy right here is D, baby. A polar function is given by R equals F of theta, which means nothing, equals negative one plus sine theta. As theta increases on the interval where theta is between 0 and pi over 2, but not including those numbers that will play an important role. Which of the following is true about the points on the graph of r equals stuff? I hate the fact that they have to throw in that f of theta just to confuse you. Don't let it confuse you. Don't let it confuse you. What we're going to do is we're going to make a table of values, and we're going to use the values that would normally be used in a reference chart. Even though we're not supposed to include 0 and pi over 2, I'm going to, you can't stop me, and then I'll explain what's going on in a little bit. So we have theta here, we have r here. I'm going to plug in 0, I'm going to plug in pi over 6, I'm going to plug in pi over 4, I'm going to plug in pi over 3, and I'm going to plug in half a pi. That's supposed to be 3, and I'm going to plug in half a pi. All right? Now, the function that I'm supposed to use is sine theta minus 1. So if I were to plug in 0, I would get 0 minus 1, which is negative 1. Sine pi over 6 is root 3 over 2 minus 1. I'm not going to lose sleep over the math behind that. Uh, pi over 4 is going to be root 2 over 2 minus 1. Pi over 3 is going to be 1 half minus 1. And then pi over 2, when I take the sign of that, is 1, and 1 minus 1 is 0. So in the limited space that I have, what I want to do is I want to graph these values on a polar plane. Now, oh man, I really did a bad job giving myself space. All right. Here's 0, here's pi, right? All of these guys represent the values that I want. So really the only things that I need here would be uh, this is 0, this right here is pi over 2 right here where d is, right? So you would be pi over 6, you would be uh, pi over 4, you would be pi over 3, so I'm going to try to recreate that over here in this very sloppy picture that I have. Very sloppy. All right. All right. Let's graph this guy. At uh, 
zero, negative one. So zero, I'm gonna have it go to negative one. So let me make just some arbitrary circle and I know it's gonna look awful. Uh, it could be worse. All right, so that zero represents the radius of one. Let me get a different color. So at zero, negative one means I don't go in the positive direction, I go in the negative direction, we have a dot right there. At pi over six, which is this way, I'm going to go root three over two. Root three is, I don't know, uh, one point something. Okay, so the what's important is as, as my theta gets higher, this number gets smaller. So root three over two is one point something over two minus one, which is going to give me a dot kind of close to uh, the x-axis, but going in the opposite direction, okay, like so. If I were to plug this in, it would get closer. If I were to plug this in, it would get closer. And then at zero, I hit back. So what's happening, and it's really hard to tell because my picture is just simply not doing it justice, is first off, these guys don't count. But even if they did count, what's happening is it starts off at the x-axis, goes away, but gets closer to the x-axis. So as theta is increasing, my points are getting closer to the x-axis. So the points on the graph are above the x-axis? No. The points on the graph are above the x-axis? No. The points on the graph are below the x-axis? Yeah. And are getting closer to the origin? That is true. The points on the graph are below the x-axis, true, and are getting further away from the origin, that's not true. So this requires some polar coordinate knowledge, which is pretty cool, because <laughs> of polar. And it's, <laughs> the answer is, is C, the answer is C. All right, we are now in the calculator section of the AP test. Thank God, because look at this problem right here. Not gonna be fun, not gonna be fun at all. The temperature in degrees Celsius in a city on a particular day is modeled by the function capital T defined by T of little t equals that. Where little t is measured in hours from 12 p.m. for these bounds, two is in between, or t is in between two and nine, including those. Uh, based on the model, how many hours did it take for the temperature to increase from zero degrees Celsius to five degrees Celsius? So this is basically what we do, okay? We, we care about the temperature being equal to zero, set that equal to that, and five as well. So the first thing that we would do is we would say T equals this awful, 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 awful guy right here. So numerator stuff, denominator stuff. Now when z zero equals that, the denominator doesn't matter because you multiply both sides by the denominator and you get zero equals the numerator, uh, which is gonna be 75t cubed minus 836t squared. I'm just rewriting the top, which is kind of a waste of time. But this is what's gonna happen. You are allowed to use a calculator here. When you type this into a calculator, maybe you type in y equals into a calculator. And then the nice thing about this is we're given bounds of two and nine. So it's not like you have to super worry about changing your calculator settings with all these big numbers. What's gonna happen and what you're gonna see if you were using like a standard, sci not scientific, but a standard graphing calculator is you're basically gonna see that line, okay? give or take, which means it's going to go through the x-axis somewhere here. You use your calculator and you find out that that number right there is t equals 5.42. So what we can say is when the time or when the temperature is zero, all right, when the temperature is zero degrees Celsius, the time is 5.42. Two, which basically means five o'clock and like 20 some minutes or whatever, 
okay? Now we do the same thing with five. We type this guy into a calculator, all right? We type this guy into a calculator. You type out Y equals blah, 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 this whole terrible thing. It's awful, okay? But what you're gonna do is you're going to minus five. Why? Because the temperature, and let me, let me erase this picture so I have more space to do some stuff, okay? The temperature, we are now setting equal to five degrees Celsius. So big T is now five. That's gonna equal this ugly, terrible fraction. In order to find out where the zeros are, we subtract five from both sides, and now we have ugly, terrible fraction minus five. So you graph that ugly, terrible fraction. You go to your graphing calculator. You see a picture that looks kind of like this. It curves a little bit, and then it hits the y-axis. And we care about when y is 0. It hits the y-axis at t equals 7.701. So what that tells us is it's 5 degrees at the time 7.701, which is like, you know, 740-ish. Now all this stuff, what are we gonna do with all this stuff? Well, we care about how much time has passed? How many hours did it take to get from zero degrees to five degrees? In other words, how many hours is it from five something o'clock to seven something o'clock? Well, let's subtract 7.701 minus 5.42 is going to be, uh, I don't know why I put T, but uh, 2.281. Which is awfully close to that. So maybe there's a little bit of rounding error in the math that I did. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But I'm not going to lose sleep over the fact that time is going to be different by 0 .001 hours, which is no time whatsoever. Okay? So ugly calculator problem is going to require some calculator knowledge. And that's what we did. That's what we did. That's what we did. The table represents values for a function f at selected values of x. An exponential regression, y equals a b to the x, is used to model these data. What is the value of f of 1.5 predicted by the exponential function model? So if you were using a graphing calculator, and I'm not going to pull up one right here because everybody has different graphing calculators and some people use Desmos and there's all these different things that can be used. What you're going to use in your calculator is something called exponential regression. I believe I do an exponential regression on my channel from like 10 years ago, and I think I use an 84 plus, TI 84 plus. But after you type all of this stuff into whatever calculator that you have, the equation that you get is this. Y equals uh, 2.4076, 1.5568 1.5568 to the X power. Okay. What I have to do is I have to find F of 1.5 which means replace X with 1.5. So you just type that into a regular calculator, 2.4076, 1.5568, 1 to the 1.5 power, and the number that it spits out for you is 46.7663. So knowing that there's gonna be some rounding errors, maybe some calculators calculate this differently, 4.67663 is awfully close to 46.7667. I don't know. I know I probably misspoke several times as my ADHD, but the answer is A, because that is awfully close to that. Unfortunately, it gives you numbers where you really can't make predictions. I mean, you would want to look at this and say, I'm going to guess it's somewhere in between 40 and 56. That's true. But these numbers are so close together that you can't really make an accurate prediction just by looking at the graph. You need to know how to do exponential regression on whatever calculator it is that you use. And that's the number that we got. So I'm sticking with A.
The number of minutes of daylight per day for a certain city can be modeled by the function d given by d of t equals 160 cos blah, 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 plus 700 blah, blah, where t is the day of the year. And oh, look, the days of the year. Which of the following best describes the behavior of d of t on day 150? So it's very, 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 very tempting, very tempting to just plug in 150 into this get some number and try to find your answer. But the problem is, is it's not asking for the value, it's asking for the behavior. So what we have to do is we have to graph this function. So I'm going to pull up a picture of the function. Uh, there it is. Of course, I'm pretending to pretend that the picture is right there. But what's important here is at 150, my graph is doing this at 150. So the behavior of my graph at that very moment is things are increasing. So we want increasing. So let's eliminate some answers. The number of the minutes of daylight per day is decreasing? No. The number of minutes of daylight per day is decreasing? No. So it's a toss up between A or C. Now at this moment, we have a concave down thing going on. Okay, we start out steep, but it's slowing down, slowing down, slowing down. So when you have a concave down section of an equation that's increasing, it's increasing at a decreasing rate. So my guy is A. And if you're like, wait, wait, what happened? Well, if I were to look at the slope at this moment right here, at this moment right here, the slope is pretty steep. But then it gets less steep and then less steep and then less steep. So what's happening is my rate is decreasing even though my number of minutes is still increasing. So the answer is A based off of the picture that I pretended to show you in my mind, but I actually showed you in reality. Try wrapping your brain around what I just said. I actually can't really do it myself. The function g is given by g of x equals sine x minus cos x and has a period of 2 pi. I don't know why it gives you that information because it's a calculator section. I'm going to end up showing you a graph to this anyway. But in order to define the inverse function of g, which of the following specifies a restricted domain for g and provides a rationale for why g is invertible on that domain? All right, what does all this mean? Simply put, the graph looks like this if I were to not tell you anything about it. And what I'll actually do is I'll show you a picture of the graph, but I'll also draw it right here. Uh, let's try to make this somewhat accurate. Mirror, mirror, mirror. Now we know that if we were to take the inverse of this, that flips it up and makes it look like that. Well, we know that that's no good because that fails the vertical line test. So what we can do to see where this is not going to be uh, invertible, in other words, where can't I take the inverse of this, is we do what's called the horizontal line test. And that allows us to be like, oh, well, it's you can't use these pieces right here because that fails the horizontal line test because if I were to flip it to its side, it would fail the vertical line test. So what I have to do is I have to use the picture that I'm going to show up here and find out where um, my guy it is going to fail the horizontal line test. So this these are basically what I'm looking for. Okay, where is this invertible? Okay, where can I flip this to its side and have it pass the vertical line test? Well, this here says between zero and pi, uh, because all possible values of g occur without repeating on the interval. Well, zero and pi, according to this picture, zero and pi fails the horizontal line test. So a is no good. Between negative four, or negative pi over 4 and 3 pi over 4, it passes the horizontal line test. Hooray! So let's just kind of hold on to this. C has the same first part as A, so C is no good. D has the same first part, uh, but D is no good, or D is still good, I'm sorry, as B. So let's have B and D there, and let's understand why. 
if I were to do the horizontal line test, I have no repeating parts. So B is going to be my guy. So why is D not my guy? Because it tells me that the length of the interval is half of the period. That has nothing, 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 nothing to do with any of these guys. Because technically all of these guys are half the period. So if we were to be like, well, if it's half the period, then why don't I just choose this guy? No, because being half the period has nothing to do. Like if I were to pick these points right here at the very tippy top, this fails the vertical line test. And this number is much less than half the period. So half the period has nothing to do with it. It has everything to do with whether or not the points that I choose pass the horizontal line test and B passes the horizontal line test. So B is my guy. Very strange problem. Not a fan of it, but there you have it. A theme park thrill ride involves a tower and a carriage that rapidly moves passengers up and down along a vertical axis, as shown in the figure over there. The carriage is carriage is lifted to the top of the tower, then released to move down the tower. The ride involves 10 controlled bounces from the highest point to the lowest point and back to the highest point. So it starts up here, down, up, down, up, down, up, and nothing in between. Uh, the point X is located at the bottom of the carriage, okay. Uh, the height of X above the ground in feet can be, okay, can be uh, modeled by the periodic function H. So H of T is going to equal something. At time T equals 100 and, or zero seconds, X is at its highest point of 120 feet, okay. Uh, then the lowest point is when it's 20 feet above the ground. And the next time eight or X hits the highest point, it's at eight seconds. So let's try to draw this out the best that we can. Okay. We care about 120 feet. We care about 20 feet. It starts at 120, hits the bottom, goes back up and repeats itself a bunch of times. Okay. At zero, it's at its high point. It lands down here, and then it repeats itself every eight seconds. So let's get rid of this thing that I put here, and let's just focus only on the picture right now. Right now, it peaks out at 120, starts at 120, bottoms out at 20, which means I have a middle point of, what would that be, 70? Which we see the 70 there. Okay, that gives me an altitude of 50. The period is eight. So if I were to look at a very basic version, a very basic version of a sinusoidal, sinusoidal, I hate that word, final uh, function, it would be y equals a cos b of x. And since I'm not moving anything left to right, or BX, I'm not moving anything left or right. I also care about a plus C here, okay? A has to do with my altitude. So the absolute value of A is my altitude. The period, the period in this case is eight. The period is two pi over B. Now multiply both sides by B, multiply, divide both sides by eight, and then I would get B is equal to two pi over eight, which simplifies to pi over four. Okay, so I have an A, I have a B. I used cosine. Why did I use cosine? Because cosine, when graphed normally, starts out at its peak and then goes like this. So this is a cosine function. C is going to be where the middle would be, which is 70. So when I put all of this together, I'm going to have Y equals my altitude. My altitude is 50. So Y equals 50. This is a cosine because it starts at its peak. This is going to be uh, B is going to be pi over 4. So T is what they want me to use. And then plus, and let me sneak this in here plus 70, which gives me B. Now, I did this without using a calculator. 
It's important that you know that the picture is going to look like this. So if the picture looks like this, then what you can do is you can graph each one of these guys in a graphing calculator and see which picture on your graphing calculator ma matches the picture that I drew. But, you know, I'm a freaking genius, so I'm just going to do it without a calculator. I'm a freaking genius who can't spell, uh, can barely talk correctly, but I know math good, and that's all that matters.